people. So to kick it off tonight, our friend Brian Robbins is going to come and he's going to begin to share with us on why we should pray. So let's welcome Brian as he comes tonight. Bless you, bro. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nick. Hello, friends. It's good to be up here again and see everybody. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about why we should pray. Uh, and while I'm not going to be talking so much about how we should pray, because Pastor Nick is going to talk about that, it just seemed appropriate for me that we would start this session in prayer. Um, so I thought I would start with two types of prayer. Uh, one is going to be the Lord's Prayer, and if you know it, you can say it with me, and if not, it's in your notes. And that's a formulaic uh, type of prayer. It comes from Jesus. He taught us how to pray that prayer uh, in Matthew 6, 9 to 13. And then I thought, if you'll indulge me, I would then uh, lead in prayer, a prayer that came to me through the Holy Spirit one day, and the words just came to me and came out of my mouth, and it told me that's, that's how I should start my day every morning, and so... That's my prayer. It doesn't mean it's your prayer, but it's a different type of prayer. It's extemporaneous prayer, which is not extemporaneous tonight because I wrote it down. But, uh, so maybe we start with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the grace of your Holy Spirit, our daily bread. Guide me today with your Holy Spirit. Help me in my faith, Lord. Help me to be a Christian today in all that I think, all that I do, and all that I speak. Grant me a spirit of wisdom to live your word today, Lord, and to approach you with a humble and contrite heart. Help me to be a godly man and to be an example to my family. And come, Lord, come, Lord, as and when you will, to create unity of faith for my family, clothed in your righteousness, Lord, to give you glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Lord, just we pray, Lord, for this great opportunity of fellowship, and we just hope that through your wisdom and your Holy Spirit, we come to discern what it is you look for us, from us, for in prayer. I pray this in Jesus' name. Um, so what is prayer? Uh, I included a definition. I looked it up in a Bible dictionary. There are many good Bible dictionaries, and this looked like a pretty good definition. Um, it's a little forensic. Prayer is the act of petitioning, praising, giving thanks, or confessing to God. It is expressed by several different words in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Prayer can be individual or corporate, meaning as a group. It can be audible or silent. It is conditioned by the biblical understanding of God as a personal being who hears the prayers of his people. And that was from Harper's Bible Dictionary. I was doing a little light reading and apologies, I did this after I submitted my notes. So this quote's not in the notes. But I was doing a little light reading uh, from a book called The Foundations of Pentecostal Theology. So maybe it wasn't so light. I'm kind of weird. I do that stuff. And actually, I, I, I will take a pause. That's actually quite a good book. I really recommend it. I don't know what the pastors think about it, but it, it, it's very enlightening on the types of things that many Pentecostals believe. But when I was reading that uh, just the other day, two days ago, again, after I submitted my notes, I stumbled across this, this sentence about prayer that was so powerful that I wrote it down and I wanted to make it part of tonight's presentation. The Holy Spirit helps the believer to pray. Along with the study of the Word of God, prayer is the chief source of the Christian's strength for his daily life and his constant battle with the enemies of his soul. And if I could, let me read that again, because you don't have it written down. It's just, it so spoke to me, and frankly, we could end the talk with this almost, not quite. But the Holy Spirit helps the believer to pray. Along with the study of the Word of God, prayer is the chief source 
of the Christian strength for his daily life and his constant battle with the enemies of his soul. If you remember nothing about tonight's talk, if you remember that, it will bear much fruit. Well, who prays anyway? Um, I've heard that surveys have been taken, I didn't take them myself, that demonstrate or prove or suggest that upwards of 75% of the world's population prays, which is quite interesting because that's a much higher percentage of the population that purports to believe in God. Um, why and when? Usually, candidly, when we're in need. It's funny how people who aren't believers suddenly or in desperation will pray uh, when times are tough. But, of course, effective prayer is really a sincere prayer when there's a belief in the efficacy of the prayer, meaning that, that there's somebody there who actually can listen. Um, I have a confession to make. We'll talk about confession a little bit. I do have a confession to make. As far as music goes, I'm a real throwback guy. So other than worship music, I'm a believer that the best music was from the 60s and 70s. And this morning, I was listening to Joni Mitchell on my iPad, and uh, on came her song, The Same Situation, and I couldn't believe it, because funny how the Holy Spirit works, I'm going to be talking about prayer. And she starts singing in this song, and she had the following line, I'm sending up my prayers, wondering who is there to hear. Of course, when she does it, it's like, I'm sending up my prayers. I'm sending up my prayers, wondering who is there to hear. And that is really how a lot of Americans, non-Christians, pray. Because if you don't really have a belief, a strong belief in, in God, and in a biblical God, and the Christian, Judeo-Christian God, you have no reason to believe your prayers will be answered because you don't know who you're praying to. So we pray and believe in God. And Jesus talked about this a little bit, not so much in the context of prayer, but when he was talking about belief. And it says in James 2.19... It says, you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Meaning, just believing in God, was that it exists, wasn't enough. You had to believe in God. And so, believing that you might be able to pray isn't enough. You have to believe that your prayers can be answered. You have to believe in God. So now we're going to get into the meat and potatoes. Why should we pray? Well, there's a lot of reasons to pray. Um, one is relationship. Um, if you are married, if you have a husband or if you have a wife, um, or if you're not married and you have a significant other, a significant person in your life, uh, you communicate by talking to one another. I mean, we're not great mind readers, so you, you talk. You, you share your desires. You share your needs. You confess you know, your sins. You, you ask for repentance. You, it's how you grow. It's how you get to know one another. If you're a parent and been blessed with children, you communicate with your children, and you hope that your children will be honest with you and tell you what they want and what their desires are, and sometimes you need to talk to them and tell them what your desires are. Um, so it is with our relationship with God. I mean, we develop a healthy and robust relationship with God through prayer. Prayer is the way that we speak to God. If you think about it, if we don't pray, we're not talking to God. So how could we ever get to know him and how, of course, he knows us, but how would we ever get to know him and how would we ever come to appreciate how much he knows and loves us other than through a communication and that is a form of prayer. Why else might we pray? Um, a sign of faith. Prayer is a sign of faith. I said this earlier that, you know, praying and wondering who's there, well, that's kind of not demonstrating faith. We pray as a sign of faith to God that we believe that he is there and know that he hears our prayer. Uh, it says in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that has a work within us. So that, that verse is telling us we know that God is real. We know that he can do more than we ask. How do we ask? We ask through prayer. And of course, another reason to pray is because God commanded us to. That's a pretty good reason. God commanded that we pray in Philippians 4, 6 to 7, and in many other verses, I might add. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we pray in part because God commanded us to pray. And lest there be any doubt why we should do it if God commanded us, Jesus went on to say that if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. So we pray as, 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 as an act of love. We, so we pray as an act of faith. 
We pray because we are commanded. We pray as an act of love to God to develop that intimate relationship with him. Well, why else might we pray? Well, again, we use the Bible as our guidepost uh, in life and tells us how we should behave and how we should act. And, of course, Jesus and the apostles prayed incessantly. I mean, here's Jesus, the God-man, and he prayed. He prayed to God the Father. Um, we have many verses. I've only selected a few. In Mark 135, it said, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Uh, in Acts 114, it said, They all joined together constantly in prayer. Notice it said constantly in prayer. This wasn't just an occasional thing. I need something today. I'm kind of in a bad mood, or I'm kind of need some guidance. The apostles joined constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and with his brothers, Acts 1.14. And then in Acts 6.4, it says, and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So we see the apostles and Jesus frequently, constantly in prayer. Particularly, not exclusively, particularly when we want to prepare ourselves for major decisions. And think about this. One of the most significant things that Jesus did in his early ministry was to find and establish who the apostles would be. Well, it tells us in Luke 6, 12 to 13, one of those days Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. So even Jesus himself used prayer to prepare, prepare himself for this incredibly significant decision of anointing whom would be the apostles. Very powerful stuff. We also pray, of course, to overcome Satan and demons. And if you listen to Pastor Nick's sermon a couple of weeks ago in Clean, we know that Satan is real, and we need to be prepared. We pray to overcome Satan and demons. In Matthew 17, 20 to 21, so Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind, and he's referring to a very difficult demon, does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So we pray to overcome Satan and demons. We also pray, of course, to gather workers for the spiritual harvest. And this is a big part of Harvest Time's ministry, is gathering spiritual anointed individuals to join the fight for Christ, to, be, to put on our spiritual armor and help harvest and help share the gospel and spread the world. So it tells us in Luke 10, 2, he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask of the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. How do we ask the Lord? We pray. Pray, Lord, sh share your bounty of, of the harvest and help bring others to help share the gospel to do your will. Strength in times of temptation. And I think this is... This one certainly is close to my heart. I suspect it's for, for a number. Again, it says in Scripture, watch and pray so that you will not fall in temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And one of my favorite, I know I say this a lot, I just love so many Scripture verses, but truly one of my favorite Scripture verses, which before they changed Facebook, it used to be on my page. I don't know, all my quotes are gone. I don't know, how that, it's all changed, but... I love the verse that says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Amen? Philippians 4.13. But, of course, how is God giving us strength? Through our, our prayer. We pray to him. Give me the strength, Lord. Oh, Jesus, when I'm going through a tough time at work and I'm entering into a very tense situation, I pray, Lord, give me the strength. I have, I know, I have faith that you will because the scripture tells me. But please, give me the strength to do all things through you who give me strength, Lord. Amen. We also pray to strengthen others spiritually and to gain wisdom. It says in Ephesians 6.18, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. 
With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying. Again, constant. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. God promises to answer our prayers. That's the punchline. Why are we praying? Because God tells us that if you pray, he's going to answer our prayers. Matthew 6, 6 says, but when you pray, didn't say if you pray, by the way, it said when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He also says in Romans 8, 26 to 27, in the same way the spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. That might be the subject of a preaching on tongues, which I won't do. Um, finally, in this knowing that God is going to answer our prayers, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will. That's the Cinderella if, according to his will. You can go to the ball if you do your chores. Okay. If you ask anything in accordance with his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have what he, he, we asked of him. Now, it's very interesting. Um, our prayers are not always answered in the ways that we expect. You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, I pray, I'm expecting some supernatural answering of my prayer. So it reminds me of a story, it's a, a parable. There was a, there was a man, very righteous, very holy, very religious, real believer, real, real Christian believer. And uh, he was in Louisiana at the time of the flood, maybe. Uh, and he was standing in front of his house, and the water started to rise, and a policeman came by, and he said, come on, sir, we're evacuating the area. And he said, no, no, no worries. I'm praying to God. God will save me. And the policeman leaves. About an hour later, the flood waters continued to rise, and a fireman came by in a boat, because you had to take a boat at this point to the streets, rode over to the man and says, come, come, we're evacuating. The waters are approaching. The waters are approaching. The man said, no fear. I'm praying to my Lord God, and God will save me. About an hour later, the waters have risen up to the rooftop. This poor man's standing on the roof, and the Red Cross comes with a helicopter. And they said, get in, get in, you're surely about to perish. And the man says, no fear, I pray to the Lord. I'm devoted to the Lord. The Lord will save me. Twenty minutes later, the water was above this poor gentleman's head, and he drowned, and he died. He went to heaven, and he said to God, God, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for letting me enter your kingdom. Just one question. All my life, I've believed that a prayer will never go unanswered if it's in accordance with your will. And I prayed and I prayed and you never answered my prayer. You didn't save me. And God said, I sent the policeman. I sent the fireman. And I sent the helicopter. Okay. Sometimes our prayers are answered in God's use of the mundane. But what about those prayers that just don't seem to be answered? You know, uh, maybe you prayed that you, there was a girl that you were really attracted to or a guy you were really attracted to, if you're a man or, man or a woman, vice versa, and, and, uh, and, they, and they never answered, God never answered your prayers and you didn't end up with them. And now you're married to somebody else and you say, gee, I'm really glad you didn't answer that prayer. Because God answers the prayers in accordance with his will. And if you believe the old adage from good rock song, again, from the 60s and 70s, in this case from the Beatles, you don't always get what you want, you get what you need. God knows what we need. We also pray to get healing. And I'm a real believer that miracles still happen, and certainly we can see tremendous acts of healing through fervent prayer. Again, there's plenty of examples of that in the Bible. In, in Mark, verses 7, 26 to 30, I won't read them here, but that's the story, you know, just plenty of stories of tremendous acts of healing in the scripture that come through prayer. We also pray to provide praise, adoration, and thanksgiving to God. Scripture says in Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your requests to God. 
We also pray to confess, I talked about confession before, but I was kidding, but really to confess our sins and to repent. I mean, how are we confessing our sins to God but through prayer? God, I, I, I confess, I, I, I fell, I stumbled, I didn't want to. I want to do everything in my power to avoid future sin, but help me in my, help me in my actions, help me to be a Christian today, and I repent of my sin. That is an act of prayer, and fortunately God tells us in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen. We pray, as I indicated, for, for intimacy with God and self-awareness. Again, one of the great, I think prayer is a great gift. By engaging in prayer and opening our hearts and dialoguing with God to get to know Him, we are getting to know ourselves. It's, it's through that intimate discussion and confession and we actually see for ourselves in the mirror, right? When we don't, when we don't have that conversation, we, we never look in the mirror, but it's in confession, it's in discussion, it's in prayer that we actually get to know ourselves and get to know the character of God, again, through his word and through our prayer with God. So back to the Lord's Prayer, so before I hand this over to Pastor Nick, um, I started with that prayer on purpose because it reveals a lot about, again, some of the reasons why we pray. Um, Hallowed be thy name is a form of praise and adoration of the Lord. Your will be done is a prayer for God's sovereignty and his sovereign will be, to be done on earth. Give us our daily bread is a pray for sustenance to sustain us, sustain us in his word. I, to me, God's daily bread is our word, his daily grace, our Holy Spirit. Forgive us our trespasses is a form of confession and repentance. Deliver us from evil is a form of protection. And in that prayer that came to me that morning, which has become part of my daily routine, when you read through that prayer, it's all about thanksgiving, seeking wisdom, seeking strength and faith, seeking help in becoming a godly man, petitioning, in my case, for my family, because most of my family are Jewish non-believers, and most importantly, to glorify God. To him be all the praise and the glory. Amen. Thanks, Brian. That was awesome. Good stuff. So thanks, Brian, for a great look at why we should pray. And I'm going to share with you now for a few minutes on how we should pray. Um, remember, I'm sure you know, these are huge book-length topics. And uh, there's so much we could say about them. So really what we're trying to do tonight is give you some scriptures and point you in the right direction to really start uh, a life of prayer, which is one of the most exciting journeys I think any of us can go on. As, as Brian said so well, um, such a big part of that is developing your walk of intimacy with the Lord. What could be better than getting to know God better and experiencing his interventions in our lives on an ongoing basis and just being his friend? So let's talk about how we pray. And first, I want to talk about the content of our praying, the content of our praying. We should emphasize right away that there's no set way to pray. Um, I think prayer at its essence is conversational. It should be conversational. David said in Psalm 25, unto you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. And I think that's so wonderful. In other words, whatever was in David's soul at that moment, that's what he was going to lift up to the Lord. And that's really what prayer is at its simplest. Jesus also teaches us not to engage in what he calls vain or meaningless repetitions. And that's because the Lord wants our prayer to be genuine from the heart. It's better to share with the Lord what we're experiencing, what we're feeling, what's on our hearts and what we need, uh, and petition him concerning our needs than just to pray some rote prayers. And those things can be helpful, you know, to, to get us going. And um, they're, they're good as a model as to how to pray, but we don't rely on those things. We use them as a, as a springboard 
into something that's more conversational and, and more real and relational with the Lord. There are lots of good ways to organize a time of prayer, but many people, and maybe some of you, I know I was just chatting with, with someone uh, just a little bit earlier about the ACTS model. There's a model of prayer that many people have used using the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S, as a way to start. And some of us have prayed this way for a long time. The word ACTS is easy to remember, and of course, it's a book of the Bible, as you know, so that's even better. But um, each one of those letters stands for something important. And it's a good way that you can structure a time of prayer if you don't really know how to start. The A in Acts stands for adoration. It's great to begin your time with the Lord by giving him praise and adoration. Tell the Lord how awesome he is and how marvelous he is. And you know, when you start off your time of prayer by focusing on him, that's going to help you to come into his presence and to sense his presence. It's going to lift you up above earthly thinking and kind of clear the fog of the day, you know, and help you to focus on him. I had a dear friend who told me that uh, whenever he would start praying, he had to wait, uh, as he said mentally, he had to wait for the train to go by. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, when you get down to pray, and there is the, that brief span of time when you have to wait for your mind to kind of shift from thinking about your electric bill, etc., cetera, to, to thinking uh, about the Lord. And, and so this helps you set your mind on heavenly things when you start off a time of prayer by adoring the Lord. That's why we begin Christian meetings, Christian services, or night like tonight. That's why we begin with worship and praise. It just helps us to set our hearts on the Lord. The C in Acts is confession. And that's the time, obviously, to ask the Lord's forgiveness, as Brian was saying, for anything we've done which is wrong or displeasing to the Lord. You know, King David said, if I regard, if I gaze upon iniquity in my heart, he said, the Lord will not hear me. Isn't that something? Sometimes our prayers only go as high as the ceiling and kind of bounce back down on our heads because sin is something that can really short circuit our praying. It keeps us on the shore, keeps us, uh, it, it keeps us from really being able to jump into the stream of God's blessing that he wants us to experience. The T in Acts is for thanksgiving. You know, a thankful heart is a heart that can acknowledge, a heart that knows and can acknowledge that it's received God's grace. Have you ever met one of those self-made men who worships his creator? You know what I'm talking about? You ever met somebody like that? See, if you, if you don't have a heart that's filled with gratitude, then you haven't really positioned your heart in a proper relationship between you and the Lord. Paul asks us a very pointed question in 1 Corinthians 4. He says, for what do you have that you did not receive? Ooh, right? That's what the preachers say. If you can't say amen, say ouch. What do you have that you did not receive? And if you think of it like that, it will compel you to be thankful and to approach God with, with the right heart, with a heart of thanksgiving and gratitude. We need to take time every day to thank God for all of his blessings and his benefits, his salvation especially, and of course, all the blessings that we enjoy in our relationships and all the blessings that we may have in the material things of this life because it's, it's all from his hand. So take time to do that on a daily basis and it may be the making of some of us if we do that. The S in Acts is for supplication. And supplication is making strong petitions to the Lord. It means that we're making our requests known to him. Once we've praised him, once we've cleansed our hearts, we're ready for that important work of bringing our needs and bringing the needs of others to the Lord. You know, the Bible says that we're a royal priesthood, and that means that every believer in Jesus Christ is a priest. What is a priest? A priest is someone who has the calling to go to God and to speak to God on behalf of other people. And that's really a great privilege. The Bible counsels us to be bold in approaching the throne of God. Not to be timid in approaching God because the blood of Jesus has removed the barriers that were between us and the Father so that now we can boldly come to the glory of the Lord and lift our petitions to him. In Hebrews 4 it says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Aren't you glad that God's throne is not, I mean, it doesn't say the throne of scariness. It says, come boldly to the throne of grace so that we may obtain mercy 
and find grace to help us in time of need. And let me suggest to you kindly that if you don't picture the throne of God that way, then your faith to reach out and grab a hold of God for great things will really be lacking. It will be deficient. If God can help us to turn our hearts and really envision his throne for what it really is as a throne of grace and a place to get mercy, if you can catch that, your prayer life will take off. So using that ACTS framework, A-C-T-S, is one way that people can organize a time of prayer. And every day, you can incorporate into your prayer time those elements of praising and thanking Him and lifting up petitions to Him. It's also useful to make prayer lists. You know, you can make a list of relatives and friends that you want to pray for on an ongoing basis. You know, some of those cousins, you may just forget who they are. You may want to forget who they are. I don't know. But so write them down. It will help you to remember to cover in your prayers the people that you know uh, need God's grace. Keep a notebook and keep track of those things. Uh, there may be also some situations that you want to put on your list as well. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will tug on our hearts. He'll put a special prayer need into our hearts, and he will invite us to begin to care about that thing or that situation the way that he cares about it. And we call that getting a burden for prayer, a burden for that situation. Maybe there's a person who's suffering from an illness who needs your ongoing prayer. They need to become your special prayer project for a season. Maybe there's a ministry that God wants you to support in prayer, hopefully mine. Or maybe he's calling you to, to pray seriously on an ongoing basis for the life of your church. Maybe God will give you a special burden for a foreign country that needs to be impacted by the gospel of Jesus. So when you feel that tugging in your heart, seek the Lord and see if maybe the Lord would want you to adopt that situation or that country in prayer, whatever it is. And then I'd say another powerful way to pray is to begin to pray the scriptures for yourself and for other people. Start to study the book of Psalms and study the prayers of the New Testament and you'll get insight as to how to pray. You'll see what God desires people to pray for, whether for yourself or for other people. So how should I pray? Well, first, we should focus on the content of our praying. And second, I need to have conviction in my praying, conviction in my praying. I need to pray in faith. I need to pray with confidence because God's the one who's inviting me to pray in the first place. Jesus said to ask, he said to seek, and he said to knock. Really what it says in the original language, he says, ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking and knock and keep knocking. And I like that. How can we develop strong faith in prayer? Well, first I'd say make Christ your focus when you pray. Don't focus on your own abilities and weakness. Jesus said if we had faith like a grain of mustard seed, then nothing would be impossible for us. So what's important about faith is not how much of it you have, but where you've put it. So have faith in Jesus. Have faith in his name and his cross and his authority. And then I'd also say, uh, learn the word of God as best you can. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. So learn what God has said about the things that you are praying for. If you're praying for somebody to be healed, then learn what the Bible says about healing and what is God's attitude towards it. Meditate on those things and your faith will grow. I also need to pray with fervency. I need to pray with passion, right? The Bible says Elijah was somebody just like us, but miracles were birthed when he prayed because he prayed with fervency, prayed with intensity. David says in the Psalms, he says, I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me out of his holy hill. So sometimes we need to forget that we're very sweet and polite and just lift our voices and cry to the Lord. Finally, I think it's important we need to be contending in our prayers. We need to contend in our prayers. You know why? Because our prayers are opposed. Our prayers, and Brian references, our prayers are opposed by foes that are internal and foes that are external, right? My own mind and body oppose my praying. Jesus said that the flesh is weak and there's fatigue and a hundred other things that can make me too weak to pray as I ought to. And I also have external enemies that oppose my praying. Perseverance is required in our prayers because there may be demonic forces at work that are trying to stop or delay our answers to prayer. And you can read about that in the life of the prophet Daniel. You know, God uses that kind of opposition in our lives to test our faith and to test our commitment and to test our motivation. So, um, 
will we keep pressing in or will we give up just a little bit too soon and maybe never see the great answers to prayer that we might have received? That's an important thing to think about. Um, so part of this contending means that I need to pray without fainting. In other words, I need to pray without giving up. I need to pray without ceasing. In Luke 18, we read how Jesus told a parable about prayer, and the Bible says he told them the parable so that people would always pray and not give up. Isn't that interesting? Jesus didn't want people to give up in prayer. God may bear along with us sometimes, but the people who get powerful results in prayer, I think, are the people who will cry out to him day and night if need be. And that's what Jesus taught. So um, I think we've got to have something in our spirits like Jacob did, who said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So one way we can express that is by praying with fasting, right? Somebody once said that fasting puts teeth into our praying. Fasting is important for believers. It's not something that's heroic, you know, for super Christians only to do. Remember the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus uh, assumed that his followers would do three things. He didn't say uh, if you do this, but he said when you give, when you pray, when you fast. So uh, when we fast, what are we doing? We're telling God when we fast that we desire him even more than we desire the nourishment that our bodies need. But you know, what's significant is that Jesus emphasizes to us in the Gospels that there are fights that we may not be able to win unless we pray and fast. You know that. Some problems require a greater measure of faith. So Jesus tells us, you know, if your faith is weak, you need to add prayer to it. And if your prayer is weak, you need to add fasting to your prayer. Some cases are hard cases. And they need prayer and fasting. I like to say that some problems are chihuahuas and some problems are pit bulls. You know, and what will stop a chihuahua will not necessarily stop a pit bull. We need to develop a strong spirit that's going to contend in prayer with fasting and not with fainting. So we don't have time, obviously, for a fuller teaching on fasting, but there's a link there that I've given you to uh, an article that we wrote a few months ago on fasting when we were praying and fasting together as a congregation at the beginning of this year. So, so check that out. If, we, if you're interested in learning more about fasting, that will be worth your while to jump into that. But if we learn to focus on the content of our praying, if we learn to pray with conviction, and if we learn to pray with a spirit that is willing to really contend against the enemy, then I think we'll be on our way to a fruitful life of prayer. So with that, I just want to remind you, uh, make sure that uh, you're here for next week. We're going to have a